Hello, my friends. Thanks for tuning in again. As you can see, I've taken extra precautions this time because I've heard people say the coronavirus is hell on earth. And yet, the more I think about it, I don't agree with that claim because I don't think God agrees with it. And so therefore, as I think about this, here in my office, you watch where you are, I think we're safe. That said, I've given this message a catchy title. It's called, Corona's Here, So What Happened to Hell? I thought you'd like something lighthearted. No, all kidding aside, when a major event like this happens and it invades the planet with the potential for catastrophe, and we've already seen tragedies, we have to look at this from God's perspective, which means we have to look at it through the lens of history and through eternity, through finite time and infinity. So let's get after this. We, created beings, are made in the image of God as body, mind, and spirit. The spirit will live on. So the spirit in each of us has an eternal element to it that goes beyond the finite world. The body will die at some point. Some people already have. But here's the thing that God wants us to see through this, not just dealing with the tough issues that the virus has brought medically, socially, economically, and everything, but from a historical and a biblical perspective, from the day you and I are born, we're preparing for eternity. We don't realize it most of the time because we look horizontally. We're not up in the helicopter, but that's our goal today. So let's talk for a minute about history. The coronavirus will go down in history as one of the bad pandemics, but I want to talk about a few very briefly, again, for perspective. Early 15th century in Europe, hit what was called the Black Death or the Bubonic Plague. It was vicious. It was a killer. Anywhere from 75 to 200 million people died. And that is anywhere from 30 to 60 percent of the population, depending on what sources are read out there. Devastating, called the Bubonic Plague. The next one, and I'm only picking out five through history. There are more. The smallpox uh, epidemic in the 20th century, worldwide, 300 to 500 million people died. The third one, in the 19th century, it ravaged the frontiers out west, the small towns. The cholera epidemic, about 15 million people died from contaminated water and food, bad sanitation, devastated townships. 1918 to 1920, the end of World War I, the Spanish flu epidemic. Killed 50 to 100 million people worldwide over a few years. And the Spanish flu came from swine flu, which came from a virus in birds that then mutated and gave it to pigs. The soldiers in World War I ate the meat, the pork, and then they went back to wherever they were and they spread this all over the world. It was devastating. The last one, 6th century, 541 to about 543 BC, uh, Eastern Roman Empire, Constantinople was the capital, Justinian was the emperor at the time. It's called the Plague of Justinian. Thousands of people died daily and up to 25 million, which would have been at least a quarter of the entire population of the Eastern Mediterranean world died. I'm not making light of the coronavirus at all because I don't know what the numbers will be when it's done. The point is this though, life, your life and mine is short. Some are shorter than others. The Bible refers to life as a fleeting vapor. Uh, it's windy outside my window right now. If I were a smoker out there having a smoke, the wind would take that smoke and dissipate it like a vapor. It would just kind of disappear. We're born, we live a short life, and we're gone. Where? Into eternity. And Jesus speaks about this. We're going to get to that in a minute. Therefore, who we are and the way we live in this finite world, if we're preparing for the next world, must be pretty important. 
And we live in a fallen world with all kinds of death. Listen, pastoring for three and a half decades, as I did, I was at a ton of deathbeds. Babies, young children, teenagers, uh, young happily married spouses, uh, so many tragic situations. A cousin of mine devastated with cancer at 40-some years old. I've seen so much of it. The point is, everybody dies in different ways. Some will die from corona. Others will die from cancer. A friend of mine just lost his son this week to cancer, and he's grieving now. So, this speaks to us, not just about hell, but about eternity. All right, because we are eternal souls. Now, have you ever heard the phrase, I have good news and I have bad news, right? Well, this here, I don't know if any of you remember, the guy with the crazy hair in the end zones uh, at football stadiums, NFL games way back. I can't remember when he stopped. He'd be in the end zone. Somebody would be kicking an extra point or a field goal. You see him and he'd raise up his, his placard, his poster. It said, John 316. He was trying to give the good news. If you're out there, pal, good work. Well, anyway, the point of this, if there's good news, you know what that implies? That there must be bad news. So let's read John 3.16 quickly and then see what the bad news is. Jesus said this to Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes on him would not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, there's great news in there, but clearly, toward the end, there's a word perish, which can't be good. And then he goes on to say, whoever believes in the Son is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So, if I trust the Scriptures as being who they say they are, the final authority on life. If I do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God and he is the only way, the truth, and the life, I'm already condemned. And what Jesus is saying, if you believe, you have eternal life. If you don't, you will perish. Now that word perish doesn't mean to literally die. Uh, it's worse. It means eternal punishment. Look, I'm not trying to ruin your day. We're already dealing with enough bad stuff, but stay with me on this because we're in the helicopter. All right? So, the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're only, what, a couple weeks away from Easter Sunday. That's going to be celebrated virtually here. But the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was a covenant act to pay a legal debt that every human owed from the day they were born because of original sin, and yet we could not pay. So, the sin is mine, and sin brings death, which means punishment, whether it's in this lifetime, and we see it in various forms. The coronavirus is a form of death. A uh, car accident is a form of death. I'm going to be doing a message very shortly, maybe my next one, or two from now, on how the law of sin and death is a major culprit behind the coronavirus. Remember, God did not invent sin. Adam did, and Eve helped him, okay? And sin brought death. Sin brought tragedy. Sin brought darkness. So, perish means eternal punishment due to sin if I don't believe. My faith, therefore, is a legal declaration of whether I want to be in or not. Jesus speaks a lot about eternity in his gospel, so we're only going to look at a few of the things Jesus had to say about eternity. I want to go to Matthew chapter 13. A uh, ton of parables in Matthew chapter 13. Two of them I'm going to hit on quickly here. The parable of the weeds. So Jesus gives it. You can go ahead and read that. We don't have time here. But in verses 38 to 42... Jesus explains the parable of the weeds. The disciples said, please explain it. And he answered, listen to this, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, meaning him. The field is the world, 
and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom, which means those who believe. The weeds are the sons of the evil ones. So in the parable, uh, good wheat came up and weeds came up at the same time. The enemy who sowed the weeds or planted them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Sounds like an ap apocalyptic movie. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The end of what age? The world as we know it. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. I'm pleading with you. He who has ears, let him hear. Shortly after that, in verses 47 through 50, Jesus confirms this principle in teaching about the net of fish. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore, sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad fish. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the sinners from the righteous, and the sinners will be thrown into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. One more. Sorry if I'm not making our day today, but we're staying in the helicopter. We have to realize eternity is really more real than this life. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, 15 verses, we're not reading them all. Jesus is teaching, not a parable, on the final judgment when he returns and sets up on the last day the judgment of everyone who has ever lived. And he separates what he calls the sheep from the goats. Those who believe in him as the true son of God and sacrifice for the sins of the human race. And the goats, those who refuse to believe. Okay? Okay. And he says, at the end of all things, when he makes this separation. Now, if you are a Tolkien fan and you watch Peter Jackson's trilogy, uh, the final movie, The Return of the King, after Frodo finally threw the ring into the fire, he and Sam are at the edge of the volcano, very unrealistically surviving that. But anyway, Frodo looks at Sam and says, Samwise, I'm glad you are with me at the end of all things. Well, folks, that ain't what it's going to be like. Jesus is separating the two, and he passes a final judgment that will never be rescinded. And those who believe get the good news, which is verse 34. He first expounds on who you are, and then he says, The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Okay, if you believe, you get the good news. If you don't believe, you get, unfortunately, verse 41, the bad news. He says to those who do not believe, Depart from me, you sinners, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Oh, boy. I mean, I believe, and that puts fear into me. And he sums the whole teaching up with verse 46. And these sinners will go away into eternal judgment, but the righteous into eternal life. So eternal judgment means it doesn't end. There is a judgment everyone gets. I would rather be judged in this life for my sins by accepting the blood of Christ as a sacrifice than judged in the next life. If I refuse to accept, my judgment comes in eternity and there ain't no coming back from it. And there is an eternal punishment, which means, unfortunately, it doesn't end. So, people say that is not fair. And they're absolutely right. We're going to talk about fairness in another episode. If it were fair, we would all go into eternal punishment because fairness means I'm going to get what I deserve. You're always hearing people say, it's not fair that he gets that and I don't. I want what I deserve. You listen to advertisers, you deserve this car. They don't tell you why. You deserve a nicer home. You deserve a better opportunity. The Bible summarizes what we deserve. Death. Short life, 
eternal death, eternal punishment. But mercy is not getting what we deserve. So actually, the fact that we can listen to what Jesus teaches and say, if you believe you won't perish, you won't get this lake of fire. That's the greatest mercy there is. So am I in the helicopter? Am I seeing God's greater plan or am I obsessing? Therefore, let's bring it together. What now? I want to talk about my mom for a minute in terms of what now. Vera Tallow. Going to be 96 in two months. My mother has prayed with more people on their deathbeds on the way into eternity to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and their hearts have turned than anyone else I know. There is a list of people in heaven with the righteous celebrating for eternity because my mom had a perspective that is greater than what's happening on either side of me. You know what her concern was? What it should be for all of us, a care for every soul. In the coronavirus, my last teaching was how to practically care for people. But you know what? There needs to be a spiritual care. We should have an eternal urgency in us. We should be burdened for the condition of people's souls, especially now. I have been praying for my elderly neighbors here that I told you I'm giving paper towels and canned food for. I, I'm praying for their eternal souls. Why? Life is short. What if one of them gets it? But you know what? It's not because of the coronavirus. It's because of the one who gave his life to give eternal life. For God so loved that he gave that if you believe. So my dear friends, wherever you are, whatever condition your soul is, I'm asking you, be honest with yourself. Will you believe? If you don't, turn to him and tell him, I believe you. Go ahead and read John 3. Matthew 13 and Matthew 25. Find a Bible. You can get it on your phone if you don't own one. There are plenty around. Read those right there and tell others about it, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Hey, I hope this blessed you because we're in it for eternity. Blessings to all of you. Have a great day. Ciao.